Uh, hello again. This treatise is called Master of History. Humankind has passed from the certainties of faith to the uncertainties of knowledge, from faith to ignorance via knowledge, a new knowledge-filled ignorance, a surprising and paradoxical state of affairs because so much has been learned and so much mastery required as a result of the great quest for knowledge. And yet, like climbers on a mountain, the higher we go, the further away we see that our ignorance stretches. We see that the frontiers of our knowledge themselves lie unmappably beyond the horizon. The sheer extent of ignorance revealed to us by our great strides in knowledge suggests that we are only at the beginning of a vast journey. Physics. The quantum physicist knows very little about the Bronze Age history. Humanity's great strides in knowledge have been achieved at the price of a, losing a conspectus, a sense of place and time and meanings, a sense of human focus amid the non-human and sometimes inhuman immensity of things. The aim of education should be to equip us with a thorough knowledge of a specialism for which we have aptitude, and at the same time a good general literacy in science, history, including the history of ideas, and arts. Higher education has undergone a remarkable reversal. It has gone from having a general literacy as its goal, leaving special expertise to form itself latter as the outcome of individual interest and experience, to including special expertise as its goal, leaving general literacy to form itself latter as the outcome of individual interest. In educational jurisdictions, where both general literacy and specialism are valued and their mutual fruitfulness understood, the idea of liberal arts at the undergraduate level and specialism as a postgraduate acquisition was once persuasive. Impatience, expense, and the exigent needs of economies in search for foot soldiers for their technological commerce are squeezing out the idea that education and intellectual maturation need to go together and that both should be replaced by the single endeavor of training instead. A corollary of this is the idea to shorten higher education to two years duration, having it or having it or more than ha halving it from what was its normality through the greater part of its thousand year existence. If the thrust to specialism and training rather than education goes so far that the connections between different fields of inquiry become invisible, and in particular if the two cultures gap between science and the humanities grows even greater than it already is, there will be a real danger that human affairs will become unmanageable. Take a single example. Artificial intelligence and the sophistication of computer technology, including its miniaturization in weapon systems, especially autonomous weapon systems, are already being combined and developed up, um, up pace. In a dispensation where no connections are made between the impact of technological developments on the one hand and social, political, legal, moral, and human humanitarian considerations on the other hand, dangerous mismatches can occur. Understanding how much we know and how great is the ignorance exposed by our increased knowledge is valuable in helping to keep the connections in view. In the past, in the age of certainties, mainly theological, certainty could be murderous. It was thought that if I am right and you are wrong, especially about the greatest questions concerning reality and the safety of our souls, your wrongness is dangerous and has to be dealt with. But if we are all paddling the boat of inquiry together in an ocean of ignorance, our perspectives changes for the better. Given that empirical inquiry gives us defeasible probabilities, what are the standards such as the sigma scale in science that can be regarded as satisfactory short of certainty. Does this simply imply that we have to treat the concept of truth pragmatically as a possible unattainable goal of inquiry upon which the ideal inquiry strategically converges? Where does this leave the concept of truth itself? The answer is embedded in the question. The concept of truth is the concept of an idealization towards which inquiry strains its every sinew, and by which we measure the degree of confidence we place in our finding and our proposals. 
This has an important implication, that when we think of knowledge as our best and most rigorously supported belief, we are in effect thinking of rationality, of what it is rational to believe. Rational means ratio, ratio no, that is proportional. It is about the ratio or proportion of our beliefs to the evidence we have for them and the soundness of the reasoning we apply to them. This is why it is irrational to believe there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. All of the evidence for fairies, such as it is, comes from stories, legends, and other people's beliefs. This applies to quite to a few too influential, influential ways of thinking, not least religion. There is an asymmetry between rational beliefs taken as true when the supporting evidence is very strong, and irrational beliefs taken outright as false when in addition we find that premising them or acting on them leads to a high incidence of poor outcomes. This is that we find that rational beliefs tend to be highly coherent with each other, mutually consistent and often mutually supportive. And when coherence fails, as between quantum theory and general relativity, the matter is not allowed to stand. Irrational beliefs, on the other hand, tend to be independent of each other, and two or more can be and often are held together or simultaneously with rational beliefs, even when inconsistent. An example of the first case is when it is believed that ghosts can pass through walls, not interacting with matter, and can do one physical harm, thus interacting with matter. This is how one can try to dissuade one's own offspring when children from fear of the supernatural. An example of the second case is holding the belief that the deity is omnipotent and wholly good, inconsistently with recognizing that natural evils such as childhood cancers exist. The, inconsistently, the inconsistency implies a failure either of omnipotence or goodness on the deity's part, or more rationally still, the non-existence of such an entity. Though the usual solution to this problem, known in theology as the problem of evil, is that suffering, including children suffering from cancer or starvation, serves some greater long-term good opaque to us now. The carpet of divine inscrutability is always a good place to sweep difficulties under, and the kind of maneuver in which it consists is a mark of irrational belief in its own right. The twelve problems that beset inquiry and the rest set the terms of inquiry. They are what variously have to be worked around, taken into account, dealt with, accepted, understood, or best of all, solved. They define the nature of inquiry. Recognizing their existence goes hand in hand with the new world of inquiry that has lately generated such huge amounts of knowledge and such a huge, even larger understanding of our ignorance. In the age of certainty before the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries, when the when the, when the stalled quest of classical antiquity was at long last resumed, these problems of inquiry were scarcely thought of. They are the children of knowledge and, and its correlative ignorance, and they are what help and will help knowledge in its explorations of that ignorance. Knowledge brings the ability to do things. The ability to do things can create moral dilemmas. These latter can be made worse by the new ignorances that new knowledge brings with it. Of the three domains of new knowledge surveyed, we have history, science, and the mind. Neuroscience is one that, causes, that carries seeds of good and bad things with it, both very good and potentially very bad. Knowing what knowledge portends gives us a chance to reflect. A final point. Inquiry is exhilarating. As the human past looked up at us from the eyeless sockets of a Australopithecine skulls, as pre-classical antiquity emerged from the tells of Mesopotamia, as the secrets of nature opened to the mathematics and particle colliders of physics, as the differently oriented stripes of a visual field registered in the cells of an occipital cortex, the sense of frontiers being crossed gave those involved in eyesight into what motivates humankind's better endeavors, the unparalleled excitement of discovery. Reflection on the great adventure of philosophy shows two things. One is that philosophy rests on two deep and fundamental questions. The first is, what is there? And the second is, what matters? The first is a question about the nature of reality. What exists? 
what is existence, what kinds of things exist, what is ultimately and finally real. This raises questions about knowledge. How can we know and say anything about reality, about the world and ourselves, and the relationship between ourselves and the world? What is knowledge? What is the best means to get knowledge? This raises questions about concepts we have to understand in comprehending knowledge and how to get knowledge. Reason, experience, truth, and meaning, thus involving logic, perception, thought, theorizing, making sense of language, mind, and consciousness. This shows that the question, what is there, is the source of metaphysics, epistemology, logic, the philosophy of language, and the philosophy of the mind. The second question, what matters, is about value, about ethics, about politics, which as Aristotle saw, is continu with, continuous with ethics, it is about the good life and the good society, the question of our obligations and responsibilities, our judgments about wrong and harm, and how to remedy them, remedy them, remedy them, remedy them, remedy them, about how to live, focusing on the kind of person one wants to be, not how they should be, and what sort of people we can be, both individually and socially. It is about what ultimately and most deeply matters, and it is also about aesthetics, which relates to the equality of lived experience. And taking all these considerations together, this question about value is about humanity and relationship, society, including other species, and the definition and meaning of life itself. The second question, or rather thing, that is shown by reflection on the past and anticipation for the future, on the great adventure of philosophy is that philosophy is a highly consequential enterprise. It all began as reflective and serious inquiry about anything and everything, and as it matured, a number of central themes emerged. Those just identified as implicated in the two great questions, efforts to answer them have indeed taken many forms. But throughout history, and even seven million years of prehistory, progress has been made, and in the 16th and 17th centuries, philosophers interested in the structure, properties, and behavior of the material universe, people like Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton, began to find good ways to ask and answer their questions. And the result was the birth of modern science, brought on by the Renaissance, spurred on by the Enlightenment. In the 20th century, philosophy and logic played a major part in the rise of computer science and cognitive science. We still, however, do not know what ultimately exists. We still wrestle with problems about what is good and right, about how society should be organized, about meaning and value, and especially about the quest for the good and the worthwhile life. Many people do not think about these things, preferring instead to take a pre-packed set of views from some conventional tradition to typically a religion from which most of them cherry-pick what is convenient and ignore what is inconvenient. But philosophy, however, as well as science and history, is the refusal to be lazy and lethargic about the great questions that have occupied the minds of conscious humanity. History, philosophy, science, all inquiry patrols the circumference of the little patch of light that is knowledge, looking out into the dark of ignorance to seek the shapes that appear there. Even though most people shy away from accepting the challenge to think, Bertrand Russell said, quote, most people would rather die than think, and most people do. They still find themselves often enough confronted by a philosophical question about right or wrong, about what choice to make in some fundamental respect, about what it all really means, considering that teleology is not dead as long as the human race persists and survives extinction. Thus, each person given the privilege of a capable mind is a philosopher at least once. All take a part in its endeavor for the love of wisdom. Thank you.